Hello, friends, and welcome to St. Basil Writers Workshop. This is our first of several interviews with the teachers and staff of St. Basil's. We want to uh, introduce them to you all, if you don't know them already, get to know them better, and uh, in the process, uh, let you know a little bit more about the program and uh, how much better it's going to be the second time around. So um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Catherine Hyde. <clears throat> I think we all as authors know that terrible sinking feeling when you first uh, talk to people for real, who are real writers and uh, they ask you, you know, what do you write and can I see what it is that you wrote and, and that, that horrible fear of having to actually, you know, open up to someone else and expecting the inevitable horrible evisceration. But sometimes if you're very lucky, you come into a space where you are uh, safe and free to talk to people that you trust, and you might actually get some uh, encouraging and uplifting uh, responses from your writing. That's certainly what happened to me with Catherine. Catherine was very instrumental, whether she knows it or not, in uh, getting me past that kind of vague sense of, I'd like to write something sometime into, oh, I can actually do this which is, for those of you who have felt it, an amazing feeling. And uh, if you haven't felt it yet, don't worry, you will. And we will make sure that uh, we can help you with that. But in any case, uh, Catherine, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me a little bit for these lovely people. Thank you for having me. It's good to uh, see everybody. Yes. Catherine, can you start by telling us what you're currently reading? I am reading two things. I'm uh, for f more or less just for fun. I'm working my way th through the, all the Campion books for the oh. third, fourth time. Um, those who aren't familiar, Campion is a, a detective who's a little bit like Lord Peter Whimsey, uh, Golden Age British writer Marjorie Allingham, and it's she is a fantastic writer. She's even if you don't care for mysteries, these books are worth reading for the amazing prose. So I like to get, I like to reread her periodically to get inspired. And then I'm also um, reading some Henry James because the uh, book I'm working on right now, the the seventh book in my Crime with the Classics series, is Justice with James. Ah, okay. So is is Marjorie El Marjorie Ellingham also? research for the for the next book or is it more just to get in the in the spirit of the thing it's just for you know to remind me of of the kind of writing that's possible within the mystery genre so i don't get lazy <laughs> <laughs> because uh we writers must be readers otherwise we stop writing well and that's if you, if you come away with nothing else from this conversation let that be the one thing you remember uh, Catherine, would you tell us a little bit about your personal journey as a writer, was there a specific moment that you knew you wanted to write? Yeah, um, I books were always important in my family. And for me personally, my father was an editor. Uh, I taught myself to read when I was four. And so it was not a big step um, to deciding that I wanted to write. But that step happened when I was 11 years old. I had an assignment for an English class to uh, write a story based on a one paragraph prompt. And I had so much fun with that. I decided that was what I wanted to do. It took me another 30 years to get around to really starting a novel, but I made it, I, you know, children and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Got <in the> way. <laughs> How did you keep the fire going? Uh, was it just... Did you scribble on the side? Were you just an avid reader? Was there, was it a single project that was gestating constantly? How did it work for you? I did a lot of writing of, of different kinds. I wrote short stories, a few poems, some articles. Um, when I was working for what was then Conciliar Press, I wrote for, again, in Handmaiden magazines. Um, and I, I did some attempts at picture books that never went anywhere. Um, small things because that was all the attention I could muster as a mother of little children. I had two widely separated sets of little children. So 
took a while to get to the point where they were all out of the house for some hours of the day and I could think about something longer. It's it's really interesting to me how how people are able to maintain the the consistent momentum for something longer like a novel even without mm-hmm. having the chance to do it. Um, oftentimes I think for people it's it's the example of somebody specific that either living or dead that they they want they want to emulate. <clears throat> Was was there a person for you, uh, or yeah. was it just something that was? There, there were two two writers who inspired me in very different ways, um, at around the same time. I read a biography of Charlotte Bronte, mm. and she had to overcome a lot of serious obstacles in order to become a writer. And then I also read the first novel of Janet Fitch called White Oleander. I went to college with Janet Fitch. We did not get along. (laughs) (laughs) And I figured if she can write a bestseller, (laughs) I can write something. (laughs) It may not be a bestseller, but I can write a book. That's wonderful. So you had it covered both from the positive and the negative. No wonder wonder it kept you going for so long. (laughs) That's wonderful. Could you introduce us in your own words to your fiction? What genres do you write in and why did you choose those genres or did they perhaps choose you? Oh, okay. What I've mostly been published in is um, traditional mystery, which is my, by my definition, mysteries with an amateur sleuth and a minimum of gore um, and emphasis on uh good overcoming evil Mm -hmm. no not a lot of super gray areas in there um and then i also have written orthodox children's books but i started out with i wrote three novels that um some people would class as women's fiction which is a term that i don't care for but they are um books you know with with women protagonists working through various things in their lives and but they have an orthodox slash supernatural element and that made them impossible to sell <laughs> at that time uh, so after coming close but no cigar with with one of those books um i decided well i've always loved reading mysteries why don't i try writing one they're popular, they sell, maybe this is how I can actually get in. And lo and behold, it worked. I had my first mystery, Arsenic with Austin, uh, was about half done when I won a scholarship to a mystery writing conference. And was uh, part of the deal was that I got to meet with an agent and she loved what I had and wanted to see the rest. And I sent it to her. She read it over Thanksgiving weekend and signed me immediately mm. and sold the book in February, I think. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this was after I'd been writing for about 10, seriously, for about 10 years. So I call it my 10 year overnight success story. Right. right. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? scholarship and how it worked um this it was associated with this particular conference which was the book passage mystery writers conference held at a a bookstore called book passage in corte madera california and there's a one person who associated with the conference who's been sponsoring this scholarship for many years uh you submit i think it was 10 pages and some committee reads them and, and chooses one person to uh, get a a free ride to the conference was it is an expensive conference it's relatively expensive and it's also um, expensive to stay there Uh so i I could afford either the conference or the hotel but not both right right (laughs) and and the uh the meet and greet with the agent uh was part of the was part of the package um I think that it, it's possible for other people to get that also. It wasn't an exclusive thing, but I think I had like priority, mm-hmm. you know, pick, picking which agent I wanted to meet. And was this the kind of um, speed dating type thing that they, that they do sometimes at these conferences or was it a more substantive sit down? <laughs> it was a, it was like a 20, 30 minute meeting. Wow. They didn't wow. do speed dating at this conference. Okay. That's really interesting. So was this like a, um, 
I'm just curious because we're talking about about this a lot in uh, mm -hmm. inside the community, inside of the online community about how how actually you can get signed by an agent as opposed to the you know the sort of stock. <clears throat> the stock uh, advice you get from all the books, which may or may not work more often than not, what I find to be the case is not cold calling. It's it's these kinds of specialty situations where you're actually face to face with somebody and they can connect uh, a work with a person as opposed mm -hmm. to just uh, ca catching an interesting premise. Um, so did you prep the agent in advance by sending her work or did you have to, did you have to be a good saleswoman uh, and explain your idea in, in in front of her over 20 minutes. If I remember correctly, she was sent my my scholarship submission. So oh. I didn't even have to submit it. And then she contacted me oh, wow. and said okay. she wanted to meet with me. Okay. So there was already, all right. So there, there's a little tip, another little tip for you, for you people. By the way, this kind of stuff, these kind of insider tips, we have a lot of them inside the uh, St. Basil's on the community. Um, and I'll talk maybe a little bit more about that later. But um, it, this this um, industry, Catherine will, I think, be, uh, agree with this. There's a kind of like public facing storefront part of it where you get all the official sounding things and do this this way. It has to you know conform exactly to these rules, et cetera, et cetera. For the most part, you have to follow it. But the mm -hmm. number of people that actually get in through a broken window or through uh, an underground secret chamber or by, you know, jumping from one building to another or, you know, <laughs> insert any metaphor you like here, basically by doing other things like getting to getting to know agents in different contexts or uh, having it having a contact uh, inside the the um, uh, the writer industry or stuff like that more often than not it seems like those are the stories that end up becoming the the easiest successes of course there are still plenty of people that do the, the traditional route but yeah, yeah. it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> the one thing that i have unanimously heard you should never ever do uh -huh. is to at a conference to follow an agent into the restroom and shove your manuscript under the stall <laughs> It's probably just good human advice in general. Don't do that yeah. to anybody about anything. Oh, goodness. All right. Well, in addition to working as a writer, you've also worked for almost 35 years now as an editor uh, in both Orthodox and secular markets. So what are, you, what are the traits you think make for a good developmental editor in particular? Somebody who can see the potential in a manuscript, but not just see it, but also be able to help a person to, you know, cut off all the guff and bring mm -hmm. out the beauty within? Well, it's, it's a difficult thing to talk about. Mm. It's kind of like trying to teach math to somebody who doesn't understand it intuitively when you do. Yeah. Um, but I think a, a crucial element is having an organized mind you have to be uh, most of the developmental editing I've done to this point has been nonfiction mm -hmm. and you have to be able to look at a manuscript and see the structure of it the ideal structure of it whether or not that's being realized yeah. um, you have to be able to see how how the author could build an argument you know from point a from the in, from the introduction to the conclusion with you know logical transitions along the way um I personally have a passion for conciseness. Mm. Um, I'm constantly cutting out extra words and that sort of thing, but that's not necessarily a requirement. <laughs> I think the the um, what is probably the most helpful is to have read widely and to have a sense, just an intuitive sense of what constitutes good writing and when a point is being made effectively and when it isn't. Um, I would, if anybody's interested in, in working toward this kind of career, I would recommend just immersing yourself in the works of C.S. Lewis because he is the clearest writer I know. He's a genius, but he manages to communicate everything in simple language, in clear arguments, you know, it's it's just I I don't I don't know of anybody who's a better model for that. So, um, yeah, and you you have to have objectivity. That's um, which 
for me personally means that I can't work on something that I violently disagree with mm-hmm. <laughs> or that I think is, if it were fiction, that I think this book has no right to exist. <laughs> um, I have to be able to divorce myself from it emotionally. And I can't do that if I, if it pushes all my buttons, you know, but that may not be true of everybody. Yeah. But that's it's true. We we had a conversation inside the community with a uh, uh, with a rather popular sci-fi writer uh, named Christopher Rocchio, who was talking about how he had sold his he had sold the rights to um, to a five book series to um, to Daw, and in the middle of him writing the series around book three, uh, the editor that had acquired him got fired, and. Um, the new editor hated his work um, <sighs> primarily because uh, as Christopher will tell you behind closed doors, he, what the, what the books actually are is fantasy, but far future science fiction fantasy, like in the, in the Dune style. And he's, mm-hmm. as, as the books are going further and further along the series, he's getting more and more mystical. And clearly the editor is not unhappy with some of the developments. So it ended up with uh, him actually having to, continue the series in a different publishing house, which is something that happened to you, I believe. Is that right? Yes, it did. And it was because uh, the there was a restructuring in the company. My first two books were published by Minotaur, which is a division of one of the big five, you know, and St. Martin's and ultimately Macmillan is the, is the yeah. head company. But um, they did a restructuring and my editor was let go. You know, she was pretty much retirement age anyway, but but she was let go. And the person, whoever, you know, was left was not invested in my work. And, um, you know, I wasn't a bestseller. I earned out my pretty decent advances. Mm-hmm. So I felt like I had, you know, some kind of claim on sticking around, but they they weren't behind me. And so the series was dropped. I had to find a new home. But you you ended up signing with a different publishing company. Yes. I signed with Severn House, which is based in England, and they have a reputation for picking up orphaned series. <laughs> and they, for some reason, they just really like doing that. <laughs> so, and just able to make a go of it. Out of curiosity, you so this means you've worked with a big five imprint and what I'm assuming would be considered in the industry as, as an independent house. Is Severn considered an indie? Um, it isn't anymore. It it okay. is it just recently has come under the umbrella of Canongate, which is a, a larger company. Okay, okay but, but it was independent when I signed with them. So, based on your experiences in the two places, obviously the first one wasn't wasn't very positive. But um, what what was it like in being both in in both situations? And do you think that that the dream of being signed by one of the big five uh, is as glamorous as Maybe that's a leading question. I'll just I'll let you answer it how you like. <laughs> well, the advantage of of the big five was that they backed me in terms of promotions. They did. Okay. Um, the the days of of book tours for new authors are long gone, but yeah. they they did um, they did promote the book. They if I sent them names of of uh, you know, journalists that I thought might review it, places where I might do an appearance, and they they arranged appearances for me. They arranged reviews and guest blog posts and all that sort of thing. Um, Severin does none of that. Mm-hmm. They get the book reviewed by the big guys, the Publishers Weekly and Kirkus, and which don't like me. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that helpful. <laughs> oh dear. I think I did get a, a positive from one of them once, but. Um, but yeah, they they market primarily to libraries and primarily in the UK, and their uh, sales model is not friendly to the way U.S. bookstores buy books. Mm. So this the difference in sales is quite dramatic. Mm-hmm. Um, the advantage of Severn House is that it's the it's a small staff, so everything is much more direct and personal. I have a really good editor that I love. Um, things happen quickly, uh, whereas Minotaur was like, you know, it moved like something from the age that a Minotaur would have lived in. (laughs) (laughs) 
So there are, you know, pluses and minuses both ways. It's it's interesting. Um, it, you do, there's a very strong sense of your love for the classics, which is not, not perhaps something that a lot of uh, writerly advice focuses on these days. If, if people give you advice about how you're going to get published, it's rarely, it rarely includes the sentence, read all of the classics. And yet, mm -hmm. if you read the, the nonfiction work of somebody like Ursula Le Guin, who I think is one of the greatest science, uh, science fiction fantasy writers of our time, um, she has a book where she quotes the classics much more than she does than she quotes contemporary uh, science fiction and fantasy writers when giving examples of how to write well. Um, mm -hmm. And this, I think, lack of general reading and knowledge of the classics is is very it's reflected in that low level of of um, both literacy and just the quality of, of literature these days. I think, but you've been steeped in them throughout your life. You've loved reading the classics. How how has that contributed? How's, how how has that love contributed to your development as a writer and also as an editor? I think it's it's a matter of reading. You can't unless you are you know one of those rare geniuses like Dickens or Dostoevsky. You can't rise above or the level of what you've taken in. Yeah. So you have to take in the very best. And of course there are really good writers living today. Yeah. Uh, there are several writers in my own genre that I almost revere. I have all their books and, um, but the, the classics are more reliable. Um, you don't want to imitate the way that they write too closely because mm -hmm. there are fashions in these things. And, you know, if you read Jane Austen, she'll spend five chapters just in backstory or Trollope, he's even worse. And nobody's going to buy that in this market today, but they will teach you how to look at human behavior and discern the deep motivations and convey that in a way that speaks to the reader. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll teach you how to use the English language. Um, you'll get just a sense of the rhythm and the beauty that's possible in English prose. Um, if you can internalize that, um, it's just incredibly valuable. It's um, And the, the substance of, of the classic novels is, you know, they're not fluff, they're deep. Mm -hmm. They're, they have something important to say. They, you know, they, they don't, Dickens kind of wrote, you know, it, it, with a message, but in general, the classics will touch on many themes within a given book and many different aspects of, of human behavior and teach you to look at yourself in a way that you otherwise might not. Um, and to look at the people around you and to, to with more compassion and with more understanding. So their, their ability to, to, in spite of not always being the most successful human beings in a complex society, their ability to, dive deeply into like you said human motivation and understand human psychology and understand the the interaction with people at a very profound level um that's something that's that's difficult for human beings now especially because because of the deep divisions in our society and also because of the tendency to uh, to become atomized and to really focus our all our attention on the, unfortunately the, what we're doing right now the the screen and and you know not not living a full life of interaction with other human beings in a in a setting that doesn't allow for the kind of rushing about through life uh, that we're forced to to do these days so um, and in spite of the fact that many of them had limited view had limited apertures through which to view the world Charles mm -hmm. Bronte you know a lot of the women writers of the 19th century they're the depth of uh, profound wisdom they had about what it meant to be human is truly remarkable 
Um, so that's how it can help us be better writers. But what about being a better editor? Oh, there I think it's mostly a matter of just internalizing what good writing looks like, sounds like mm -hmm. to the ear. Um, and that can be tough, right? Because like you said, in the 19th century, there were conventions that don't work these days. Mm -hmm. And yet you'll read Jane Eyre and you'll, you'll stumble across a sentence that is about as concise and as witty and as brilliant and as subtle as anything written by anybody in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the trick then is to figure out which, you know, which sentences are the ones you need to emulate. Any, any, <laughs> uh, any insight on that? <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, anything that speaks to you, yeah. you know, um, and it's going to be different for different people. Not right. everybody thinks Jane Austen is the greatest writer that ever lived. <laughs> I, I would actually put a few other people in that category along with her, but, um, but yeah, any, anything that speaks to you, if, it, if a sentence or a paragraph is weighed down by outworn conventions, then it probably won't speak to you. Mm -hmm. If it's getting to the heart of the matter in a way that is timeless and universal, then it will speak to you. And that's something you could work with. What, you know, a lot of the best advice when it comes to understanding good writing involves that part of us that you can't analyze. It involves the heart. It involves intuition. It involves having a sense of something that kind of just comes out of nowhere that you can't really describe or explain away. And that, that mm -hmm. frustrates some people. But I think what you're, what you're telling us is that you can develop this sense very, very clearly if you read the classics well. And I think you're, you're echoing a point that a lot of a lot of writers would make and C.S. Lewis would make that case again and again and again, I think. Um, and so it's less about, I think, understanding the technical uh, features of good writing. And it's more about immersing yourself in good writing so that it becomes a natural thing that you gravitate to, like you mentioned. Um, if you could teach only one essential writing skill, what would that be? Um, gosh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I would recommend that every writer get very comfortable with metaphor. Mm. There are a lot of other things that I could mention that are, you know, typical things that people say to beginners. Mm -hmm. But um, if you're comfortable with metaphor, then you have the ability to express the deeper meanings of whatever it is you're writing about without beating people over the head with it. And I think that's the, you know, if, if we're not striving for that, then what are we doing? If if I can hone in on that a little bit, when you're talking about being comfortable with metaphor, are you talking about being having a uh, an ability to like to use figurative language effectively, or is it something more specific than that? Um, it has it has to do with using figurative language effectively, but m even more importantly than that, it has to do with seeing connections between things. Mm -hmm. um, basically a metaphor is a connection that's drawn between something that's obvious on the surface and something that's deeper or different or somehow sheds a different light on the thing that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I did the, the strengths finder thing yes. some years ago. Anybody's familiar with that? Yes. And one of my biggest strengths was connection. Okay. So that's I think that's a really important one for a writer. And um, I think that's a very encouraging thing to say to new writers because, uh, well, famously Jasper Ford in his in in one of his uh, Thursday Next novels, 
I don't, uh, I don't know if you've ever read Joss before. I think he's wonderful, but um, they're parodies on 19th century literature, but done in, in with a lot of taste. Um, he made the, the comical uh, observation. One of the characters did that the last original idea in fiction appeared in 1888. And I don't know why it was 1888, but it's just some random thing. But uh, I think what you're saying is actually very encouraging to new writers. The, the, the originality thing is less important. What's interesting though, is that of course, if you are the kind of person that cultivates uh, yourself as a human being, which means reading a lot, which means reading widely, which means reading well and carefully, then meta the metaphors that you come up with are not going to be hackneyed because they're going to be coming through a very unique vision of the world that that comes from that can only come from a, from you from a single human being who has an experience like nobody else's. So I think that's a very uh, that's a wonderful answer and a very encouraging one I think to new writers that actually yes uh, there is a way you can you can write something that's familiar and yet also fresh and also new um, primarily because of your uh, your own personal ability of doing that thing, that metaphor thing. So I love that you said that. That's wonderful. Um, what about self-editing? Is there an essential skill that you think every writer needs to have, even if they farm out their work to editors professionally? I think the most important thing is to get enough distance from your manuscript that you can see it objectively. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do that, which I talk about in my course. Um, probably the most valuable one is just time. Mm -hmm. You know, when you finish a, a, a draft, the temptation is to just jump right in and start revising it. But you really will accomplish much more if you put it away for a month or more if you can possibly get yourself to do that and then you'll come back to it and it won't. If, if you read something over too many times, it begins to feel like a fixed thing. You know, it, it take it, you read it as if it were already a published book and it can't be changed. It doesn't need to be changed. Yeah. So you have to get enough distance that you don't see it that way. You see it as malleable and flawed and, and fixable. Yeah. Uh is there, do you think that there might be a period of time where it's dangerous to wait? I'll just tell you from my own experience that um, with my busy schedule, sometimes I'll, I'll not finish a, a story, but I'll be in the middle of a story and I'll have to put, a, put aside the, uh, the manuscript for a while, a few months usually, not something like a week or a month. And I'll come back to it and I hate it with a violent passion, not because it's terrible, but because it's, it's completely different from where I am right now. And I recognize it's false, but not on a technical level. I just hate the person who wrote that and I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> so is there, is there a, a recommended maximum that we should avoid when it comes to giving uh, that distance? I think that probably varies from person to person and from book to book. Um, I know for myself, it is dangerous to leave something that I haven't even finished the first draft of. It's dangerous to leave it for more than a couple of weeks because mm -hmm. I, I just lose the flow. And then I have to go back and reread from the beginning. And every time you reread from the beginning, you get closer to that place where it feels unchangeable. Yeah. You know, so even if I don't hate it, and sometimes I do hate it, and sometimes I, I get to the where I left off and I think, well, I don't know where to go from here. You know, I, I left without a clear idea of how I was going to go forward and I still don't have a clear idea of how to go forward I have had I have abandoned books for that reason yeah well let's let's shift our discussion a little bit and talk more specifically about St. Basil's now um, when I first approached you asking you to join the faculty what was it that made you want to support the mission of St. Basil's well obviously as an editor for ancient faith I've worked with a lot of orthodox writers um, a smaller number of fiction writers, but you know we've, we have had a steady trickle over the years of people submitting fiction manuscripts um, that they can't publish anywhere else because there's too much orthodox content in them. Yeah. But in the vast majority of cases, unfortunately, they're not ready for prime time. Um, and you know sometimes I'm able to tell a, a writer, okay, you have potential, the story has potential, but you need to do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes they go away and do it and come back with a great book. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they 
get in a huff and go off and self-publish the manuscript exactly as it is. And I go, <laughs> only maybe and that's the last we hear. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, as an editor, I don't really have the freedom to give a lot of, of detailed guidance to somebody who needs to improve their manuscript. You know, it's just it's just not the format for it. Um, and but I, that's something that I have a heart for is to help. I mean, I've, you know, I've been there. I've been that writer who wanted to publish a novel that had too much orthodox content and and, you know, other flaws probably as well and felt stuck. So I want to help people get past that place and get to a place where they have a novel that is at least worthy of being published, even if it's still a challenge to actually get it published. Yeah. And also you, the, your request came at a time when I was looking to shift the focus of, of my work um, a little bit away from ancient faith and more towards fiction. And so it was it was a good time for me to accept that new so, challenge. Expanding that a little bit more, do you, do you think... What do you think about about a program like St. Basil's makes it different from other um, other kinds of programs that prepare writers for publication? Because there's tons of them. So what is it about mm -hmm. what we're trying to do here that's different? What do you think? Um, it's a little hard for me to say because I haven't actually been through any of those other programs. I've been to workshops at conferences, but that's a very yeah. limited kind of thing. I do know people who have been through MFA programs. Um, and my impression of those is that everybody comes out pretty much sounding the same. Yeah. There's like a, a, a certain style that they're aiming toward, you know, and that and the whole workshop um, vibe encourages that sameness because you're it's it's like the old man and the boy and the donkey you know you're listening to all these people telling you to do different things with your work and it can end up just homogenized and boring with all the life sucked out of it so i think um that part of the part of what's great about saint basil's is that we can work with people on a more individual level so that we we can guide them in the direction that they want to go Mm -hmm. rather than a predetermined direction that we think is good yeah and, and the, the other thing of course it. is the orthodox orientation that um you know people writers going into any generic secular program are going to be on the defensive all the time yeah. if they're orthodox if their writing has any orthodox content or worldview at all they're constantly going to be having to say well you know this is how i see the world and there's it's a valid way of seeing the world <laughs> and and then the focus is off of actually improving their writing and on defending what they're writing about. So um, I think it's extremely valuable to have a place where Orthodox writers and Christian writers can be nurtured within uh, their own worldview. Was there anything that happened in, in year one in your interaction with the students within St. Basil's that, that surprised you? I was a little surprised that um, only about half of the registered students participated at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've talked um, about the freedom I, to choose your path, so I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, if I had invested what what they had to invest in the course, I think I would have milked it for everything it was worth. Um, beyond that. Um, I guess it wasn't really surprising that there was a, a strong um, tendency toward fantasy writing since given yes. your own <laughs> orientation. And, yes. Um, and, all, and just in general, I think younger writers, they probably have preponderance of them are pointed that way. Um, so it wasn't surprising. It was a little bit of an adjustment for me since that's not my primary genre. You mentioned that that one of the advantages of of a, of a program like St. Basil's is that it allows us to shepherd individual writers towards maybe more specific needs than 
uh, than a more generic program would. Um, did you find in your interaction with the students that, that actually put in the work, um, did you find that you were able to take, did you find that you were able to actually do that in a way that was satisfactory to you in a way that perhaps you didn't, don't, didn't have a chance to do in, in, in a place like ancient faith as an, as the acquiring editor? Um, yeah, not, I think, um, I wasn't able to take it as far as I might like to. Um, that's one reason I'm looking forward to offering the individual coaching because we'll be able to go through, yeah. you know, an entire work or a big part of a work and, and really dig deeply and address whatever the issues are. Whereas within the class, um, it was just a matter of, you know, reading, a reading small sections mm -hmm. before and after revision. And, sure. um, I do think I, I hope I was able to help people address some of the things that they needed to address. No, you, did, you definitely wasn't. did based on the feedback. So, uh, but you, <laughs> you already started to talk about the, uh, the coaching, uh, program that you've recently opened. Uh, this is a one-on-one -on -one coaching program for prospective students, especially, um, the idea initially was to have it open for, uh, previous, um, applicants to the same basal program that didn't make it. Uh, but we're also open. Um, we're also considering opening it more widely. Can you tell us more about the program, who it's for, how it works, uh, number of sessions, how to contact you rates, things like that. Okay. Since it is, um, <clears throat> a, a baby program, it's somewhat flexible. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my idea is, is that, uh, for each session, somebody we would submit a chunk of work, maybe around 20 to 30 pages <clears throat> that I would then evaluate and we would meet and, and discuss that, that section. Um, and I, I hope that people will continue long enough to get through a whole novel or the bulk of novel, but I'm not setting any um, requirements about how long they have to continue. I, I think I did say a minimum of two sessions, mm -hmm. but um, beyond that, it's up to the student. Um, and I, I'm limiting the number of students because I want to be sure that I have enough time to really give the appropriate amount of attention to each student's work. So I'm limiting it to five or five at a time if I have some who only go for a little while, then I can pick up something else when they're done. Um, the cost is a hundred dollars per session and it's, uh, people can pay me directly through PayPal or whatever else we work out. Um, I currently have, uh, two students starting in November and, uh, a possible third that hasn't quite confirmed yet. Um, the, the goal, I guess, in terms of um, what we want to achieve is um, that's something that I think each individual student and I will kind of work out together. Uh, I expect I'll have some people who are earlier in the process and some people who are farther along. Um, so I, I want to give them whatever they need to get to the next level for them, whatever that might happen to be. So you're open to varying levels of, of expertise and experience when it comes to um, writing experience. Yeah. I do not want to work with somebody who just comes and says, oh, I have this idea. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can't work with an idea. I can only work with pages, words on paper or on, you know, whatever, figurative paper. I have to have actual writing in hand, but um, that's that's pretty much the only requirement. Wonderful. Um, I don't want to leave the the question that you left hanging um, about the your favorite uh, current mystery writers that you revere. I, I must know who they are. And oh, if, okay. Any one of them, Anne Cleves, by any chance? <laughs> I actually haven't read any Anne Cleves yet. I have watched the series based on her books, and I love them. And she is on my list to get to. But I have to say, when you've watched a series, it's a little <laughs> bit nervous making to go and read the books because you know they're going to be different and they're very different they're not, <laughs> they're not close at all not even close. 
Maybe, maybe that's good. Maybe that'll help me appreciate them better if that they're not close. But um, my my number one is Louise Penny, who okay. writes the Gamache books. And part of what I love, well, a big part of what I love about her is the community of Three Pines, where most of the stories are set, because it's it's a community in the real authentic sense of an Orthodox community. You know, mm-hmm. the people are involved in each other's lives. They care about each other. They're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it they create among themselves a safe space. That, and uh, uh, can I just interject for a second to say that I didn't get very far in the in the Amazon uh, uh, version of the Three Pines stories, but that's the oh, one thing that they couldn't. They, there was no community whatsoever. No, I was so put totally off by like them. everybody was unpleasant. I didn't want to spend any time with any of the characters. I was like, no, <laughs> this is awful. Yeah, and I I I persisted just because I kept hoping that it would get better. Yeah, but it didn't. <laughs> it was yeah. bad. Yeah. But um, then another favorite is uh, Jacqueline Winspear, who writes the Maisie Dobbs books. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons I love them is that they're set uh, beginning between the wars in Britain. And that's the same era as all my favorite dead English women, <laughs> the, <Yeah. laughs> the, the women writers of the golden age of British detective fiction. And then she moves on I think she's currently nearing the end of World War II. I haven't read the latest one. But I also love them because Maisie Dobbs is a, she, she her detecting style is based on psychology mm-hmm. and a certain amount of mysticism. Mm-hmm. And she's um, she's just an extremely thoughtful and compassionate person. And I just love the way she works. And then I'm also very fond of the number one ladies detective agency books. Oh. <laughs> they're they're like candy. I mean, they're comfort food. You know, a candy's not not doesn't do them justice, but they're definitely comfort food. Sure. Um, and there again, it's about the community. It's yeah. about a group of people who have shared values, traditional values, mm-hmm. um, that are being threatened by the developments of the modern world, but they're holding fast to these. Mm-hmm values and you know the the main character's husband is often referred to as the kindest man in Botswana (laughs) and and the setting is fun too I don't think I'd actually want to go to Botswana because I hate heat but I love reading about it (laughs) that's wonderful well let's open up the floor for a few questions we have about nine minutes so let's keep the questions short and uh yeah please the floor is open what would you all like to ask And Anna, if I miss something in the chat, let me know. Yeah, I've seen a few things fly by, but you yeah, can't I, read that. And yeah, me neither. <laughs> and <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No questions. Impossible. I don't believe it. <laughs> well, I have a question. All right, Matushka, go ahead. Um, you mentioned writing about metaphor, and uh. <laughs> My mind immediately goes to uh, G.A. Hinty. I don't know if you've ever read him. He wrote, uh, okay, Action Adventure for Boys. Uh. But he would have a whole chapter about a thing, like maybe a crocodile hunt, that didn't seem to do anything to further the plot, but was a complete metaphor for what the boy was going through Mm. at the time. And Mm. so that's what came to my mind when you said that. But then I also have in the back of my mind, your comment about being concise and there seems to me to be some tension there between having like building metaphorical things that have to do with maybe the character's motivation or struggle but aren't driving the plot and being Mm -hmm. concise could you further expand on that please yeah um if you were if you read my fiction you might not say oh this is a person who really cares about being concise it has it's something that applies a bit more directly to nonfiction, to um, omitting sort of circuitous ways of saying things I I hate sentences that begin with there I get rid of them if I possibly can Um, or there's a sense in which I I hate that (laughs) you know that 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 kind of thing so I that that was I was thinking on more of a micro level 
when I was talking about being, okay. but it also applies on a larger level. You don't want to, um, if it, well, talking about fiction, um, you need to trust your reader to get your points without them being too explicit. Um, and without being repeated time and again. So that's an area where it's good to be concise, but I, I, that what you're talking about a whole chapter that's a metaphor for something the character's going through I've done that that's I don't think that's a violation of the principle of being concise it's um if it contributes to um some aspect of the story whether it's plot or characterization or theme or whatever then it has the right to exist in your manuscript thank you Just chime in, people. You don't have to raise your hand or anything. Just, uh, just start, just start talking. You're all so nice. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm okay with ending a little early. Oh no, wait. Inga has a question. Go ahead, Inga. The topic of the kind of like maybe abandoning an idea or abandoning it. Uh, books. Um, at what point, like? Maybe do you notice it? And this is for Nicholas as well as Catherine. Um, like what what kind of experiences have you had where you just kind of dropped an idea or dropped a story that you were working with for a while? Um I've had very different experiences with that. One, um I started writing a novel that was uh loosely based on my mother's life. And my mother had a very hard life and was in many ways a victim. And I, I took the beginnings of that book to a workshop. And by some weird coincidence, all the participants in the workshop were women and they were all writing about victims. <laughs> and when the instructor uh, caused us to come to terms with the fact that victims do not make good protagonists mm -hmm. unless they somehow transcend their victimhood mm -hmm. you know you they they have to be active they have to assert themselves and overcome in some way you know and i looked at at what i had and i realized first of all the the victim thing was going to be a problem and secondly i couldn't write objectively about my own mother's life and i didn't want to just create some story that you know, had the same setting or whatever, but wasn't really about her. I, I wouldn't have been interested in doing that. So I abandoned it. In another case, I I got much further along with a story. This was would have been um, a volume in Prime with the Classics. And uh, I created a situation where my, my amateur sleuth is first involved with and then married to the sheriff of her town and they investigate things together. And I, in this book, I had created a situation where he was called away just as the investigation was beginning. And my protagonist was gonna have to deal with a stupid state cop. And I realized I couldn't write that. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it just wasn't happening. I didn't, I didn't know what to do with this character that I'd invented. Um, so I, I gave up on that one. So it can, it can happen in all kinds of ways, any, any period in the novel for any reason, you just, you just have to develop a sense of, okay, when is this a problem that I need to push through and come to a solution? And when is this a fatal flaw that I just need to abandon? There's only one thing I might add, and that's speaking of Clifton strengths. Uh, the strength finder, the thing that you were talking about, Catherine, uh, for people who are high in ideation, I am, um, the, there's some really good advice from people who know, like these are people who have studied the uh, psychology of writers and, and can give pretty de decent advice to people. So if you've, ever, if you've ever taken Clifton Strengths and you're somebody who knows you're high in ideation, uh, you owe it to yourself to finish all ideas that you have started even if at the end of it, it's garbage, set it aside. <laughs> um, but for somebody who's high in ideation to, to leave 
a story unformed can actually be very damaging because your psychology wants it to have a conclusion. Even if that conclusion is you got to the end, you read it and you're like, I'm never showing that to anybody and throwing it in the garbage. But <laughs> coming to the end is very important. Otherwise you can get stuck like, and, and it'll, it'll keep bothering you until you do it. So this is also a difference. Different writers are, are, have different ways of approaching this, but I have found that to be the case for me that if that, my ideas come hard and fast and they, they're very exciting to me. And if I lose the enthusiasm for it and set it aside, I'll stop writing anything because it's like, it's like my brain is telling me, I gave you this excitement and you're not doing it with it. You're not doing anything with it. So I'm not going to give it to you anymore. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're not a, you're not good at this. So, so that's it. So sometimes mm -hmm. you need to finish them. Um, but yeah, I, I think Catherine's right. You, you develop an intuition. At some point you realize, yeah, this can't go any further. And, and you just, yeah, you kill the darling. <laughs> Although I, I do keep all my kill darlings in a special folder. And sometimes some interesting things can come out of there in, in a different story or they can become something slightly different. So ha have, a, have a file for your kill darlings. They might come back in odd ways. <laughs> yes. Hopefully not as zombies. <laughs> no. Although, although, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stephen has a question. In your opinion, when does anachronism help a work's voice rather than detract from it? In the same vein, what are common anachronistic mistakes you find in your editing work? Good question. Anachronism. Um, the, the kind of anachronism I see most frequently is having characters speak in modern language using idioms that have only arisen within the last couple of decades, even though they're supposed to be from, you know, a previous century. And it drives me absolutely nuts. <laughs> if I'm watching something that, uh, that does that, it just, it just drives me nuts. Um, I think deliberate anachronism can work in a story that breaks the fourth wall a lot. Is everybody familiar with what that expression it comes from theater where you're addressing the audience directly um, or a story that has kind of tongue in cheek um, or if you are deliberately trying to muddle the waters as far as time and possibly space are concerned um, then anachronism can be effective. But if it's just it, if it's just laziness, if you just haven't done your research well enough to be correct and authentic, then that's that's not justifiable in my book. Is that more chariots than Carter has pills? Brownie's fiction protagonist. <laughs> oh, oh gosh. <laughs> By the way, somebody who does anachronism yeah. really well is uh, uh, Eugene Vodolaskin in his novel, Loris. Oh, um, the whole book is anachronism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really great example of, of where it's being used deliberately to, to muddle the, muddy the waters. Yeah, wonderful. Well, Catherine, thank you for, for your time. Everybody else, thank you for coming. I, I uh, appreciate the rapt attention and the good questions. Uh, this is only the first of four or five that we're doing with the rest of our uh, instructors at St. Basil. So keep an eye out for future um, announcements for these kinds of conversations. They'll be happening one a month. Uh, and and uh, yeah, so thank you again. And thank you, Catherine, for, for your time and for your wisdom. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. All right. I'm Happy writing. Yes. <laughs>